Hi, I'm Gareth. You might be rather intrigued by the title of this video, kind of writing bad four-part harmony. Why would somebody want to make a video about that? Well, what makes bad four-part harmony? We'll think about that as we go. But the sort of thing that I've written on the board is quite often the sort of thing that I see from students that I teach who are trying to improve their harmony. They've kind of got something that essentially works, but there are various things about it that could work better. So let's put it that way slightly more positively. And there are certain conventions about writing harmony and the conventions some people want to disagree with, you know, what's the problem about uh, writing consecutive fifths or consecutive octaves or doubling major thirds? Why does something need to move on to a particular note just because there's this thing called voice leading? Well, we'll try and explore some of that during the course of this video. But I think generally speaking, the way to look at these rules, if you like, is just to say that there's kind of advice that's come out of hundreds of years of people writing harmony that generally suggests that if you follow them, you quite often end up with a better result. So let's start by listening to the passage of harmony that I've got written on the board and see what you think. Okay, so this is how it goes. And I'm sure there'll be some people who say, well, sounds all right to me. Thing is, could it sound better? And that's what we're going to investigate. And it's a way of also just teasing out some of these rules or what I prefer to call advice about writing harmony. And then you can see if actually by following the advice, it makes for a better result. And if you want to break the rules, well, at least you know you've broken them and that you've got a good reason for doing so. And that's true of all the great composers of musical history, really, that they often do break the rules, as it were, but they do it when to break the rule is going to give you a better musical result. So that's a little bit critical. Okay, well, I'm gonna do the best I can to maintain the melody because actually quite often the, the melody is a bit of a given. There's one spot where I'm going to change the melody for reasons that I'll explore in due course. Okay, so we'll keep all of that. I'm gonna change these next two notes, but we'll come back to them in the fullness of time with an explanation as to why I'm changing them. Okay, so we're gonna try and sort of keep the chord scheme as much as we can in place, but just have a little think about one or two things. Now, if we look at the first bar, the first measure, let's see what there might be that's not so happy about that first bar. Well, the first thing is, you might notice that the soprano part is going from G sharp to B, and so is the tenor part. So we've got two parts going G sharp B, an octave apart, and these are known in the trade as consecutive octaves. Now, consecutive octaves, is that such a big deal? Actually, sometimes they don't sound too bad at all. And sometimes when you're in more than four parts, you get away with them a little bit more easily. But Sometimes in four parts, you do tend to get the dominance of those two lines moving in the same direction. So it's just something to watch out for. If we can avoid them, we probably get a better result. And another point I want to make here is that once you break one of these so-called rules, quite often you end up infringing at least another one as well. So let's have a think about if there's anything else about this bar that doesn't look quite so good. Well, here, We've got chord one in E major, and this is a major third, so is this. All right, so let's just sort of put M3 for major third. And one of the bits of advice is when you have a major third in a chord, it's best not to double it in four part harmony. So it's usually better to double the root of the chord or the fifth of the chord rather than the major thirds. Somehow minor thirds are, can make less of an impact, but doubling a major third tends to dominate the chord a bit. You know, when you hear that, it's got a lot of G sharp in it, isn't it? So there's a double major third. Now, in the next chord, when you look at this one, you notice there's no third in it. 
because we've just got E and B, E and B. So that chord sounds a bit empty, doesn't it? Could be really effective if you want that sort of empty sound, but there's something missing there. So one of the other rules um, is that we have to be careful with thirds. Thirds normally need to be there, but at the same time, we don't want to double our major thirds. We can double minor thirds more easily, but we don't want to double the major thirds. So you see what I mean? We've got these consecutive octaves, but we've also got other things that impact on the bar. Now, I don't think we need to do very much to this bar to clean it up. So have a look at this suggestion and see what you think about this. So if we keep everything the same as much as we can, but we make this amendment to it, what's now going to happen in the first bar is this. It's going to sound like this. Now previously it sounded like this. Now it sounds like this. Now, I don't know about you, but it is a cleaner sound to my ears and it's a more balanced chord system that we've got there. So what have I done? This is quite a useful trick, actually. If I'm going from chord one to chord one, so there's no harmonic movement, we're just repeating the same chord. And I've got this sort of thing, you know, octaves going on between uh, the top and one of the middle parts, say. One thing you can do is kind of reverse the parts. So if this is going G sharp B, well, this part could go B, G sharp. So you just switch those notes over. Now, it's great because it puts them in opposite directions, so you're not going to have any consecutive trouble. But it also takes out the double major third of the first chord, and it puts the third in the second chord. So that's pretty cool. Are there other things you could do to improve it? Well, yes, there are. But for now, that would kind of deal with it, wouldn't it? So I go from here to there. I mean, you could say, well, wouldn't it be better if I went from an E major and then I went to a first inversion chord or something? So I had the bass going down to a G sharp and then maybe have a B in the tenor part. Well, yes, that would probably be even better because you'd be going 1-1, one, one, but the inversion would change, you know? So you could do that. So, um, you know, another option would be to look at doing something like this because there's a little bit of progression on the chords then. I'll tell you the other good thing about that as well. It sort of helps the bass line going into the next bar, doesn't it? G sharp going up to A is quite handy as well. So, you know, that would be another possible improvement to change that one into a 1B chord. Okay, now let's have a look at the next bar and see if there's anything about this that's just worrying us. Well, I'll tell you the issues here. First of all, this is a chord four. Always good to know which chords you're dealing with. If you're in a major key, chords one, four, and five are major, two, three, and six are minor, seven is diminished. So when you have a major chord, it has a major third in it. So if you're writing in a major key, if you're writing chords one, four, and five, those are the chords where you don't want to be doubling your major third. Now in a minor key, the major chords are usually five and six. So those are the chords where you might want to be doubling your, your major third in a minor key. Okay, so uh, we've got a four and then it's progressing to a four B. Well, that sort of seems quite a good idea actually, doesn't it? Because as we were talking about here, going from one to one B, then going from four to four B, you know, this idea of repeating a chord, but moving to a different inversion can be quite handy. Be careful about second inversions, they're a little bit harder to deal with, but root position, first inversion, some mix of those two is usually a good thing. Now then, here we have a major third, here we have a major third. So we're back with a double major third that we could see if we can do something about. You might also notice between the alto part and the tenor part, there's quite a big gap. And that's also true in the next chord. Now this I find is quite a sort of common issue and you notice it also happens in the next chord. Now there is another little rule or piece of advice that says try not to have more than one octave between two neighbouring parts unless it's between the tenor and the bass parts. 
Now, the reason why that happens is that sometimes if you get chords that are kind of thickly spaced out, you, know, you can hear a couple of notes up there and a couple of notes down here. They're a bit dislocated, aren't they? There's a big hole in the middle. So it's particularly evident in the first chord. The next chord's not so bad, but it's still quite a big gap there. This one's even better, but there's still a bit of a gap there. So best to try and keep soprano to alto within an octave of each other, alto and tenor within an octave of each other, then if you want a gap between the tenor and the bass, that's absolutely fine. And what lots of people do when they write harmony, they think, oh, I've got a melody in the right hand, I'm going to put a chord in the left hand, say, if you're doing it on a keyboard. So you get one note in the right hand, and then you get three notes in the left hand, and it all goes a bit kind of clunky and thick in the left hand, and a bit muddy and indistinct. Actually, a lot of harmony works much better the other way up, sort of thinking, well, three notes in the right hand, one note in the left hand, you know, so three plus one rather than one plus three. And even when you're writing four parts, which looks like two plus two, there's still a sense in which we're writing three, soprano, alto, tenor, and bass. So that gap between the tenor and the bass is absolutely fine, but try to rein in the gaps between other chords. So that's, in a sense, the biggest issue here, isn't it? Now, we need to get rid of our uh, problem with that third, and we want to close the gap. So could we do something like this? So do you see what there? We've still got the same chord four, but I've got a better spacing of it now. I've got rid of the double major third, there's only one C sharp, and I've spaced these parts so they're closer together. So we originally had this with a double major third and this big distance. Now we've got this. So that's a much cleaner sound, isn't it? And then we can probably do something with this chord. For example, if we perhaps keep the A we had there and we keep the C sharp there. Um, I'm wondering if perhaps we can go up to E in the tenor. So as I'm taking that note that we had there and putting an octave higher. I think that will work for us. Yeah, don't see why not. Good. Okay. So that's kind of just re-spaced those two chords, you see? So we've got this, and now we've got this. And then maybe, now we've got the tenor up a bit, we can take care of this gap in the next chord by doing this. We had the G-sharp that we've got there, but we put the tenor up on this E, and we have the bass where it was. Okay, so do you see what I've done there? It's largely a question of spacing, isn't it? So I can have these bigger gaps, like here, there's more than an octave between the tenor and the bass, but that's fine. Sounds good there. It's a three in the right hand plus one in the left hand. Much better than doing it the other way around. Um, I think we've dealt with the spacings, we've dealt with the major third, all that kind of stuff. Are there other things you could do? Oh, absolutely. You could, for example, if you wanted to make the bass line a bit more interesting, you could put some passing notes in. Now let's have a look at that. Do you see we had a bass line that was going A, C sharp, E, just by putting these notes in between, A, B, C sharp, D, E. These are now passing notes. Remember passing notes have to go by step. They can't leap but they can go by step in between notes that belong to the chords. So we started off in bar two, measure two with this. All the chords, good choice, nothing wrong with those. Now we've ended up modifying it, it comes like this. Now, I think that sounds better. You might want to argue about that, that's fine. But it's, again, a much cleaner sound, isn't it? And we've got all those things much more in balance. Okay, let's go on to the third bar, the third measure. What's going on here looks like a possible attempt at a secondary dominant. So what's a secondary dominant? It's when we temporarily go 5-1 or 5-7 to 1 in a different key, and then we carry on in the original key. So we don't really modulate there, we just kind of carry on. So here what you've got is a 5-7 to 1 in the key of G flat major. 
okay? And some people think that that qualifies as a secondary dominant. Now, the thing about secondary dominance, if you're using them properly, is this. You can go 5-1 in a different key and then carry on in the original key. It gives you some nice color. But the critical thing that people often forget is for a secondary dominant to work smoothly, when it goes 5-1 in this other key, the one in the other key must also be a chord in the prevailing key. Okay, so in other words, if I'm in the key of E major, and I go five, seven to one in G flat major, well, chord one in G flat major has got nothing to do with E major. So it tends to sound a little bit of a shock when you suddenly go five, one in G flat major, and then, and then we just carry on an E flat, in, sorry, an E major. So do you see that there's a bit of a kind of, mm, bit odd, it's a bit like the musical equivalent of kind of driving a car and trying to change gear without using the clutch. You know, you might get there, but it won't do your gearbox much good. And there'll be a bit of a noise when you try it. So it's kind of like, how do we smooth that out? Well, if we want to write a secondary dominant there, we need to write one in such a way that one in this other key is a chord that belongs to E major. All right, so if I got the chords of E major, well, that's chord one, that's E major, chord two, is an F sharp minor chord. So I could have a secondary dominant in F sharp minor. Chord three is G sharp minor. So I could have a secondary dominant in G sharp minor. Do you see why? Because one in G sharp minor is also three in E major. Chord four is A major. So I could have a secondary dominant in A major. Chord five is kind of strong chord in E major, but it could be the tonic chord of B major. So I could have one in B major. Chord six is C sharp minor, so I could have a secondary dominant in C sharp minor. Chord seven is diminished, so it's not the tonic of anything, so that won't do. But it gives you all the options. <clears throat> so I'm going to suggest, for example, that we perhaps rewrite the secondary dominant in the key of B major. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is uh, call this five, seven to one, but in the key of B major. So we still get a secondary dominant, but we're in a key where it's gonna be smoother because one in B major is also called five in E major, okay? And that's why that secondary dominant would work better. So let's just get some harmony in that would support that. So if I'm using five in B major, I'm going to need an A sharp. I'm just gonna change the inversion to make it more interesting. And there we go. And conventions about dealing with a dominant seventh, whether it's in a secondary dominant or not, is just to think actually, does it resolve properly? The third needs to rise by step and the seventh needs to fall by step. That's usually the best way to deal with that. So that's gonna deal with that. Um, if I keep the next chord the same, so let's just do that, and then I can show you how this secondary dominant is more effective. Um, okay, so we originally were in E major in measure two when we had this. Then we had the shock of this to G flat major and then back to E major. It's just kind of like, does it sound ghastly? Well, it doesn't sound ghastly, but does it kind of integrate into the phrase or does it kind of stick out like a sore thumb? Well, it does really. Okay, let's see if this works any better, having a secondary dominant into B major with the revised measure before it. Do you see what happens there? Because I've gone from this into B major, and then that one in B major I can call five in E major. When I then go on to another chord in E major, it kind of flows quite nicely, doesn't it? So there's a one B, and because that chord works quite nicely, I'm gonna keep it. Um, okay, so that was the, the issue over here, the secondary dominant that doesn't really sit entirely comfortably. Now, um, the harmony here is sort of working all right. And I've done that on purpose because quite often I find when students produce harmony for me, 
Um, there are corners that, that do work well. And then they say to me, well, I don't know why that bit sounds all right, but this other bit doesn't sound so good. So this is kind of trying to give you a representative example of the sort of thing that, that goes on. Um, you see, this is all quite happy, isn't it, really? We've got a good spacing between the parts. We're not kind of getting involved in any big troubles, are we? But there is still one issue. And I wonder if you've noticed what it is. Here, B, C sharp, E, F sharp, consecutive fifth. So we had these consecutive octaves back here that we were talking about. But here we've got consecutive fifths. So just to be sure, consecutive octaves means that in the same pair of parts, we've got an octave here followed by an octave there. So whether it's the soprano and the tenor, the alto and the bass, whatever it is. Same with consecutive fifths. When they're consecutive fifths, they're perfect fifths. So if you get a perfect fifth between one pair of parts, followed by another perfect fifth between the same pair of parts, then that's consecutive. Strangely, it doesn't count if you're repeating the same note. So if I have E and B and then I repeat E and B, that's not deemed to be consecutive. But here, I've got E and B moving up to F sharp and C sharp. So that is consecutive. So we are gonna to have to deal with that, aren't we? So uh, we can't really have that F sharp there. Well. What's the easiest way of fixing that? Well, to be honest, I think the easiest way of doing that is just to have an E at that point. Slightly changes the chord because this chord is a, a 2B chord, a sharp minor first inversion. And I've now changed that to a chord four by moving that note. But I think it's probably a better idea. It gets you away from this stuff that we had there. But now we've got, so that's quite handy. And I'll tell you, it just prepares us for something else that's happening in the last bar, the last measure. Because this E in the alto, I mean, it sort of sounds all right, doesn't it? You might say, actually, it sounds quite nice. But it doesn't sound, it's not part of the chord quite, is it? So you've got to ask yourself, well, what's it doing there? And it sounds a bit sort of unresolved, you know? That he has got a pull that wants to go to... Ah, now you see. So it's really kind of pulling us down there, isn't it? So what we might do is take care of that by making that E a crotchet or a quarter note and bringing it down there. Um, these other parts will be fine. I'm going to say a little bit more about what I've just done in that alto part in just a moment. So I think the final chord is pretty satisfactory. So let's leave that as it is. The other thing I want to say about this is that we've now got what's called a suspension. So when you have a suspension, you've got three moves. You prepare, you sound, you resolve. All right, prepare, sound, resolve. P, for prepare, should belong to the chord at this point. S is dissonant with this chord, which it is. And R belongs to this chord, which it does, because by the time we get to here, we've got a chord 5-7 that's going on to resolve to a 1. Okay, so P is consonant, belongs to the chord. S is dissonant. R is consonant, belongs to the chord. P and S should be the same note as each other. S moving to R needs to resolve by step, normally downwards. It qualifies as a suspension. And we call that a 4-3 suspension because that note's a fourth above the bass going to a third above the bass. So, you know, that E is kind of quite nice, but it's not prepared and it's not resolved. So it just feels a little bit stuck out on a limb if you just do it like that. But if you do this version, can you hear you've got E, E, D sharp. So we've got prepare, sound, resolve. And it really kind of fits in very nicely, doesn't it? So we get that whole progression at the end. Okay. Now, I'm sure there are some people who are going to say, well, I prefer the first version myself. That's absolutely fine. Go with it. But if you do, then kind of do it in the knowledge that there are these conventions that, uh, that some people like to call the rules of harmony that kind of make us think twice about what we're doing. And if you want to break them, then that's fine. 
but only you know do that if you've got good reason or you might listen to this and think you know what I think actually some of this does work better doesn't it um, so um, what have we got then so this is the new version sounds quite nice doesn't it there are other things you could do to that to make it even more engaging but we've ironed out the things that some people would say would make this bad four-part harmony and dare I say it by making those reservations sorted out we make it good four-part harmony so have fun with your four-part harmony I hope that's been useful don't forget if you want to make a comment put it in the little comment box below the video. It'd be great to get your feedback as to whether that's helpful or not and things you might have learned from that or things that you don't agree with. But what I'm trying to do is base all this on the conventions of harmony writing.